Hello, and just before I start the film, I'll introduce myself. My name's Alan. I make these videos from here largely, which is my motorhome. This video has had to go under a fair bit of censorship owing to a fake copyright claim and that part of this video which was made uh, in 2023 actually comes from a Swedish film called Den Bördiga Tiden which I believe means the bloody times and uh, anyway if you're interested there'll be more information at the end of the video. The 20th of April 1945 was Hitler's last birthday. On that day he was 56, although he gave the impression of someone much older. It's also the day the film Downfall commences, and as such most of you will be familiar with the events of that day. Whereas I cannot compete with such a brilliant film, I can add to some of the details shown in that production. Hitler slept at very unconventional times and his rhythm of life was forced onto those around him with conferences taking place at night. His conferences got later and later and Albert Speer noted in his memoirs that the joke was if they got any later then they would be at a time suitable for any early riser. The events of the 19th of April 1945 did not bode well. In the late afternoon of that day, two Soviet columns broke through German lines at Munchenberg, due east of Berlin, and at Vrietzen to the north. There was nothing to stop them. The German commanding officer, General Heinrich, admitted that the battle was about to be decided. Hitler had by this time been living in the bunker for some time. The unpleasant atmosphere and feeling of doom made Hitler's secretary, Martin Bormann, record that it was not exactly a birthday situation. The minds of those who had known Hitler for some time must have gone back only six years when Hitler celebrated his 50th birthday as a relatively young man for his age and with great pomp and circumstance in Berlin. Das Ständchen der Leibstandarte eröffnet am Geburtstagsmorgen den Reigen der Gratulanten. Day, the 20th of April 1939 may have been the best day in his life. It was a national holiday. Huge crowds turned out to meet him in Berlin, although Hitler did have to stand with his arm outstretched in a Nazi salute for six hours as the parade passed him by. One imagines that his thoughts turned to that day only six years previously to the mess he now found himself in and which he alone had caused. Although, naturally, he blamed others. At 50, Hitler had been young for his age. By the time he was 56, it was as though he was 20 years older. As far as Hitler was concerned, as he went to bed more or less at dawn, birthday greetings could be expected at midnight, he had asked his staff to refrain from ceremony, but a number of people gathered, and as they were there, Eva Brown persuaded him to greet the staff. Karl Sauer, Chief of Staff to Armaments Minister Albert Speer, brought a present of a scale model of a mortar. Hitler, seemingly realising without admitting that Berlin was lost, discussed with Josef Goebbels and Robert Ley about his determination to defend the Alpine Redoubt and Bohemia Moravia to the south and Norway to the north. 
What's important about this discussion is that it shows that Hitler was still unsure about what he was going to do. After the formal part of the meeting, he went back to his rooms where he had some tea with Eva Brown before retiring to bed. Around midday, his valet Linger woke him up to, uh, to let him know that General Bergdorf was there to say that the Red Army had broken through at Spremberg. Hitler does not appear to have been too bothered as he told Linger that he wanted to sleep another hour as he had not slept all night. On the 20th of April 1945, there was constant bombing by the USAAF and RAF. In the film Downfall, we see Hitler furious about the Soviet artillery attacks, although perhaps Hitler was a bit more subdued in real life. His personal doctor, Theodor Morel, gave him a glucose injection whilst Hitler played with one of the puppies of his dog Blondie. He ate a silent lunch with Eva Braun and his secretaries, Johanna Wolf and Christa Schroeder. After lunch, they all went to see an architectural model of Linz, and he showed them the location of the apartment where he had lived with his mother. Hello and welcome from Berlin, and in this video I'm going to show you where Hitler's chancery was, and what a big building it was too. But first, a little bit of location. So this here is Vostrasse. And this is Ebertstrasse, this road along here, formerly called Hermann Göring Strasse. And you see where this building is here. Uh, just behind the front of that was where the wall was. So that building is, what, a few centimetres inside former East Germany. Uh, if we go down there, we've got the Brandenburg Gate on the right-hand side. We've got the monument to the uh, Holocaust. And if I turn around here, we've got Podstammer Platz. Now, I remember being here in the 80s. This was all the uh, dead zone uh, of uh, East Germany. And there was a place at Podstammer Platz that sort of stuck out like a, a triangle into uh, West Berlin and the wall was put behind it but there were big warnings up not to go into it as it was East German territory and uh, something unpleasant could potentially happen to you if you actually went there so look at that from being absolute being a wasteland uh, uh, literally but uh, there was a place uh, on the west there was two places on the western side where you could actually go up the stairs and have a look over into the east anyway so so now I'll come back into uh, 1930s time and so the uh, Hitler's new chancery began here and there's a photograph uh, showing it from 1939 uh, I think uh, now the, uh, the, the German Reich had a uh, government building, a chancery was on Wilhelmstrasse which is down here and uh, Hitler decided that it was all right for a soap company but it wasn't good enough for him. What he wanted was something that would absolutely show off the might of his Reich and so therefore he wanted a big enormous palace in which he could then amaze foreign delegations. As you can see, nothing of it is left today. Hitler had followed very closely its construction as he fancied himself as an architect. He had given orders as to specifics on how it should be built. On the 20th of April 1945, he went into the Chancellery for the very last time with his adjutant, Julia Schaub. These two photographs are possibly the last two photographs ever taken of him. Later, he went to the garden where he greeted and decorated a line of Hitler Youth. This film is often said to be from this day, but it was not as it had appeared on the Deutsche Wochenschau one month earlier. Hitler apologised for not being able to speak very loudly, but he did promise victory. Sometime around 1600 hours, he went back into the bunker, never to step out of it again in his life. The main conference was to be held in the early evening. 
just before some ministers were able to say happy birthday to him. Field Marshal Keitel suggested that Hitler ought to consider departing. Hitler responded, Keitel, I know what I want. I'm going to fight in front of Berlin, fight in Berlin, fight behind Berlin. The conference must have been a really sorry affair. Soviet armour was surrounding Berlin from the north and the south and realising that the country was about to be split, Hitler authorised Dönitz to take command in the north while others were to go to the south. Hitler seems to imply that he would go south too, or at least that's the impression that some of the attendees got. Bormann had already launched Operation Seraglio, which was to transfer some personnel and documents to the south. I have described Seraglio in another video. By the time of the Hitler conference, however, the documentation which was to go south had already been packed and was on its way to the four airfields from whence it would depart. Goering had piles of his own stolen property hidden near Potsdam and asked for permission to leave for Berchtesgaden using Wehrmacht and Luftwaffe personnel, who possibly could have been better deployed in military or evacuation duties. However, Goering needed them to transport his booty, and as far as he was concerned, that was more important. There was a birthday party for Hitler. Eva Brown arranged it. There was champagne and food, but Hitler did not feel up to it, so he gave it a miss. There was a record player playing the one record they had available, the 1929 hit Blüter Rote Rosen by Austin Egen and Marek Weber. Hitler's secretary, Traul Junger, went to the party, but she was unable to forget what was going on around them. It was horrible, she wrote. After a short while, I couldn't stand it anymore and went back to bed. At around 2200 hours, the RAF started yet another bombing raid. Hitler called his secretaries, Johanna Wolf and Christa Schroeder, to his private quarters. He suggested that they leave. Martin Bormann would fill them in on the details. He said that he would follow them down in a few days' time. They went away to pack, but Hitler telephoned them and said that there's no way a car could get through and they would have to fly out in the morning. Hitler must have known that a daylight flight was considered just about impossible in the circumstances. He rang back to say that a plane would leave as soon as the all clear sounded. This was more or less true. The all clear sounded some time after 0200, but by the time everything was packed in the planes, it was almost 0500 by the time the last plane left. They did not make it, but it was probably just as well for them. Only one person survived on that flight, which came down to the south of Dresden, near the border with Czechoslovakia. I have described the fate of that flight in my videos on the Hitler diaries. 250 kilometers to the south, Field Marshal Friedrich Schoener had considerable success in blunting the Soviet attack in the Battle of Bautzen and inflicting on the Kremlin its most serious defeat for the next 77 years. Nonetheless, in other areas, the Red Army advance continued. To the south of Berlin, a gap had appeared between the 4th Panzer and 9th Army. Here, General Heinrich was in command. Hitler ordered him to attack in order to close this gap. General Heinrich requested pulling back the 9th Army's right flank to stop it being encircled. Hitler ordered the line be held where it was. Heinrich telephoned the general staff half an hour after midnight to protest that Hitler's order was unrealizable and hopeless. I ought to declare, Mein Führer, as the order is against your interest, I request that you relieve me of my command. Then I can go into battle as an ordinary Volkssturm man with a gun in my hand. General Krebs pointed out, The Führer expects you to make a supreme effort to plug the gaps as far east as possible, using everything you can scrape together, regardless of Berlin's later defence. General Heinrich, however, decided that his loyalty lay with his soldiers and the German people and not to the dictator living in an underground fairy tale world. He pulled his troops out whilst he still could, although many were cut off, surrounded and eliminated over the next few days. However, this also had the effect of widening the gap towards Berlin through which the Soviets were pushing. In the early hours of the 21st of April, whilst part of his staff was on its way to Berchtesgaden, Hitler probably decided to stay in Berlin, perhaps still believing that the war could be won. Speaking to his two remaining secretaries, Traudl Junger 
and Goethe Daranowski, he said, I must force a decision here in Berlin or go down fighting. In code, Bormann cabled Berchtesgaden with Hitler's decision. The last birthday situation conference brought the news that gaps in the German line in Spreewald to the south of Berlin were bigger than before. Hitler blamed the army for this betrayal. All our defeats in the east are solely the result of treachery, he explained conveniently forgetting his own rule. At around 0100 he dismissed the two stenographers, Kurt Preschel and Hans Jonuschat, so that they could fly south. Walter Hevel, representing the foreign office, appeared and suggested it was time to seek a diplomatic solution. When I'm dead, you'll have more than enough politics to contend with, Hitler replied. The all clear sounded around 0200 on the morning of the 21st of April 1945. Hitler's staff hurried to the four airfields for the journey to Einring, the closest airstrip to Berchtesgaden. Of the ten planes that left Berlin, nine arrived. They left Hitler and his diminishing circle still in Berlin, determined to end their lives and the lives of tens of thousands of others in the ruins of the capital of Germany. I hope you found that interesting. My specialist area is Second World War and in particular the Holocaust. I upload every Friday at 20 hundred hours Central European time. I'm uh, currently in Germany, but I do videos from Germany and Poland. So if that's the sort of thing that interests you, then you may want to subscribe. All the best from me for the moment. Thanks for watching the video. Uh, so I apologize for the bits that had to be censored owing to the fake claim. This film was originally put up in July of 2023 and uh, the fake claim came in almost immediately. Now, I understand myself the importance of copyright and very much understand I have had thousands of euros effectively stolen from me by people taking my material and putting it up under their own name. Now, uh, there is advertising revenues on videos like this. The advertising revenues, in my case, doesn't even cover the costs that I have in making the vehicle, the videos. So, therefore, uh, the, the revenues uh, are really needed. Now, I understand that everybody makes mistakes. Now, I make mistakes as well. But the thing is this, if somebody wrote to me and said, is this your video? I would respond. This is effectively, they're wasting my time. I could have been doing other videos instead of writing to them and having to put up things of this nature. This is quite absolutely, in my opinion, it's quite disgusting. It may just be some but some idiot in their office who doesn't know or they've given the job over to some trainee or something like this. But this is quite serious. Clearly, it's... Um, it's wasted a great deal of my time. But this is not the only time when I've had a claim like this made. There's a film called Le Commando de la Mort, uh, uh, made in France um, around 2015, I believe. I believe it belongs to La Fondation de la Shoah in Paris. And I have written to them as well to justify their claim that they own part of my my video. Now, in this case of this video, it used uh, a footage that was captured in 1945, showing how people were uh, lined up to be murdered. Now, if La Fondation de la Shoah is claiming that it owns the video, then it either got it from the person who took the video uh, who sold it to them, and which case it uh, must be aware of who the killers actually are, and this information has never been handed over, as far as I'm aware. Could be wrong, could be wrong, could be making a mistake. Fondation de la Shoah could have handed all of this information over some time ago. That I don't know. But um, anyway... I understand Fondation de Shoah also, if, if they own the video, because I haven't got any proof of that yet. I've written to them to ask them. Uh, I mean, I just used their, uh, who, who, the, uh, who the claimant is. Uh, because unfortunately, on the YouTube forms, 
it doesn't show us. So uh, what can we do? Well, the thing is, this is these people. It's this is not a free speech issue. Uh, it's a it's a business issue. Uh, it is. I really, really, really understand copyright and why it has to be protected. What I do not understand is this type of behaviour uh, that anybody can make a a false claim that uh, something uh, belongs to them. And uh, then is a claim. Now, I do, of course, appreciate there's all these people who put up things like videos or films and things on the Internet, which somebody else has paid maybe even millions, tens of millions. Well, maybe films don't cost tens of millions, but, but millions. And then uh, they want to get their money back from uh, DVD sales and uh, Netflix and uh, cinemas and things like that. I do appreciate that because these things it, it, it is and YouTube has to come down hard on uh, that 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 I absolutely understand but what I don't accept is uh, this type of behavior and above all the behavior that they um they, they'll say no no that's ours that's ours but they will not respond if I now YouTube cannot under any circumstances decide who's right YouTube is not a court of law uh, or Google is not a court of law um if a claim's made Again, uh, it's got to it's got to say, no, we can't. Uh, we will. Any revenue has to go to this company because they own it because anybody can make a claim. And this this is uh, this is part of how this racket. Uh, well, maybe it's not being done deliberately. I don't know how many de um, a Swedish film institute is actually claiming for. But um, uh, at the end of the day. Uh, if anybody else does videos and they get these claims, what happens is you you make a claim and then I've got one. There's an Italian company who seems to claim everything I do because it's used the same video and 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 immediately the claims released. So I don't have a problem with that. I understand that. It's when they don't release the claim, then um, the next step is um, it has to go to some form of arbitration or something. And if you lose, then the whole channel comes down. That's it. So uh, that that would be the end. And so um, all the videos that I put up, all whatever it is, 350 or whatever, would come down. Anyway, thanks for listening. And I hope the video about Hitler was interesting. <laughs>